all. One great place to look for answers is Intel, a pioneer in squeezing tiny transistors onto computer chips. I've met a lot of scientists who talk about switches and semiconductors, and somehow they're fulfilling the same function. But, but what is it? What we're trying to build with a semiconductor is a switch. This is one from the, the wall, something that you'd use to turn on a light and turn off. And in fact, when we push the switch up, we give an input, the light is the output. So in science fair terms, a switch then lets electricity go through or stops it. Exactly. And Based somehow, on the input, we change the flow of electricity. Electricity on or off. It's the only language computers understand. When the switch is off, the computer reads a zero. When the switch is on, the computer reads a one. String a bunch of switches together, and you can create a code. With just eight switches, you can represent any symbol on a keyboard. For a page, you need about 25,000 switches. 1.4 million will get you a second of music. Photos need tens of millions. And videos, we're talking about tens of billions. The more switches, the more power. The story of the computer revolution is the story of the shrinking switch. Early computers used mechanical relays and vacuum tubes as switches. Building a machine with just a few thousand took up rooms of space. But the silicon transistor changed all that. Because it's a material, not a machine, it's easy to shrink. Well, the exciting part about silicon transistors is we're actually using the atomic properties of the silicon. So rather than actually having to craft something to build the switch, to build the pieces, to build a spring, I actually, by doing some smart engineering, can get the electrons to flow by using the properties of the atom. And we brought some material to illustrate that. Oh, wow. we, what we, just, we have here. We happen to have a hunk of cheese lying around the lab. A hunk of cheese. <laughs> so think of this as the silicon material. I can actually take a slice of that silicon and I can use the atomic properties of this slice to build those transistors. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pentium Cesium 5. Um, I understand it works really well with the computer mouse. You can use that. All right, so, so you're saying that one beauty of silicon is that you can cut it in half, and it's still silicon. And yet you could slice it again, smaller and smaller and smaller, but it still does just as good a job of passing along the ones and zeros. Absolutely. And I can use those material properties until I get down to the size of only a few atoms of silicon. Wow. Which is not something you could do to make mechanical switches smaller, right? Like, like if I wanted to make this smaller, you know, I, I can't just go like this. Yeah. Wow. I can have a smaller one. Clearly, this is not going to be a smaller good switch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is silicon. It is a purified element that one mines. All right, so what does it look like in the computer then? Well, by the time it gets to the computer, it actually is one of these devices. So this shiny surface is a piece of refined silicon. It has transistors built into it. We've actually flipped it over so the transistors are on the other side. And what you see is the back of that piece of silicon. And this is how many of those little on-off switches? This is almost a billion transistors. Wow. A billion switches on a one-inch chip. What's even more astonishing is that one of the founders of Intel saw this coming. In the 60s, Gordon Moore predicted that the size of transistors would shrink by half every two years, each time doubling the number that could be squeezed onto a single chip. This idea is known as Moore's Law, and it has proved to be incredibly accurate. But now, 50 years later, Moore's Law may finally be running out of steam. The transistors that power our stuff are about as small as they can get, unless scientists can come up with a new way of packing them ever more tightly together. To see one of those possible solutions, I've crossed the country to visit the IBM Research and Development Kitchen. So this is Moore's Law of Italian cooking. That's right. What we're going to do is explain why it's so important to get the transistors smaller and smaller. Francis has a pretty appetizing way of visualizing this law and its limitations. Like pepperoni slices, the transistors on a silicon chip are flat. 
smooth. Okay, so here's our silicon wafer. Silicon wafer. Now these are the old-fashioned transistors. They're much larger, and you can see that you can't put that many onto each wafer. So this would be a, a 1960 iPod. I think so, yes. This, <laughs> this would be a 60s type of thing. So let's take off these old transistors and replace them with some new transistors. Oh, these are much smaller. Yes, these new transistors are much smaller. Technology has marched on. That's right. It's uh, Moore's Law in action. So in other words, all we have to do is make the transistors smaller every year forever, mm -hmm. and our gadgets will always be more powerful and more compact. That would be wonderful, but we can't make our pepperoni slices much smaller than this. And these transistors are now packed together about as close as we can get them. The pizza party can't go on forever. There's a limit to how small you can shrink the transistors. If you reduce the surface area of a transistor too much and place it too close to its neighbor, electricity starts to leak, causing a short circuit. Not good. We've run out of area, so there's only one way to go, and that's upwards. Slim Jims? That's right. <laughs> this is a vertical transistor. Instead of having flatter, smaller transistors, we go in the other direction. Excuse me? Vertical transistors? Vertical transistors. With and little toothpicks on the bottom. That's just for demonstration oh, purposes. Okay. By building vertical transistors, called nanowires, Francis can increase surface area without bringing the transistors closer together. So, no short circuit. Ingenious. So yes. this, this is what you're doing at IBM. That's, you're that's making right. these? They're called nanowires. Hmm. And the real thing is about a million times smaller than this. A million times smaller? That's right. Well, that'd yes. be hard to see. They're hard to see, but this is not a nanowire. This is a silicon sliver Francis uses as a surface to grow them. And we get tens of millions of wires on each of these specimens. Come on. Now yes. you're hurting my brain. Oh. <laughs> she carefully loads the wafer into a molybdenum clip and slides it into a custom-built oven where she'll bake it at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, I, I was just thinking, Francis, I don't think you have enough aluminum foil on this oven. Yes. <laughs> it's the question everyone asks. It holds the heat better. Aluminum foil? That's what, Isn't that's that a what little low-tech for something? That's, that's right, whatever works. Oh my gosh, so those little spires. Those are the nanowires. So you bake those up. We just grew these, yes. We can see them because this oven doubles as an electron microscope. All right, so these are these are them, huh? This is 30,000 times magnified. 30,000 times? That's right. So here's the column of silicon, that's the nanowire, okay. and here's the gold droplet on the end that actually makes it grow. It's weird, it looks like matchsticks or Weird mushrooms or? They did mushrooms, that's right. They look to me like mushrooms. That's amazing. Yeah. So we're trying different catalysts, different recipes, but this here is the future of transistors. 